Welcome to the Camera Shake Podcast, episode number 28, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that's got anything to do with photography, videography, making photos, making videos and everything and anything that's got anything to do with any of that. Occasionally we talk about gear, but today we have another awesome guest on the show. Please welcome Mr. Martin Patton on the show. Martin, how are you? Hey guys, no, I'm good. Looking forward to it. It should be fun. Excellent. Cool. This, by the way, you're probably the first guest where this intro worked first time around. No, oh, well, hey? Perfect. 28 episodes in. I think we're going to put a blooper reel together of, uh, of those intros. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Martin, uh, it's really great to have you on the show. Uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to, um, to talking to you about all sorts of different things. Now, I was trying to define you in a way, and that's just what I normally do uh, in an intro, and I found it really difficult because you are obviously a photographer, um, but you're also a photography speaker, um, a camera club judge and president. Um, you're a, a fellow sci-fi and punk rock nut as well, which oh. is always good news. Um, yeah. But I was, I was trying to define your photography. And really, the problem is the more I look at your images, it's like I see wildlife, uh, mm. awesome wildlife images. I see portraits. I see street. I see travel. I see all sorts of different um, types of photography. And it's like, you know... I've always found that first of all, photography has so many different niches that you can, you know, that you can fall into. But I really find it's really difficult to be that good at all of these different things. So, how? Tell me, how did you get into photography in the first place, and what is the one thing if you had to define yourself? How would you define your photography? Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Now, okay. I'll finish on the how can you define your photography mm. at the end. Um, I started at school um, when I was fourteen. Um, I never had a camera. We had a dark room at school, mm. and I just happened to be walking by it and uh, oh, what's this? And, uh, this sounds interesting. So I bought a manual camera, black and white film, and our uh, art teacher who ran it was a photography nut. Just loved it. Um, really passionate, excited, and brought anyone in. And so um, I learned how to process film myself. I learned how to develop it, how to actually print, which is a whole art all on its own, all in monochrome because uh, as a school kid, I couldn't afford colour film and I couldn't really afford to send it off. I did some. Um, so for me, that grounded me in a manual camera with, a, with an integrated light meter that literally was, was a, a, just a piece of wire that bounced up and down. And, and if you had it in the middle, that was you were in, you were in about the right <laughs> spot. And, and the, the shutter, as you move the shutter speed, a, a little thing like a, like a racing post, you know, the little round thing on the post went up and down and you had to try and get the needle and the post in about the right spot. And that was, a, that was a perfect exposure. So you really had to learn your craft uh, to understand what it was you were looking at. And then, of course, realizing that just because your camera thinks it's correct doesn't mean it really is. Because if it's a white background or a black background, the camera says, yeah, I'll guess at that. And then you send your film off. Or for us, developed it was interesting. Um, and I did that for quite a while and, and then bought a, a small digital camera, played with that. And then I, I joined the IT industry. Um, and which is the worst thing you can ever possibly do for any kind of hobby. <laughs> yeah, it's good for disposable income, but it's terrible for actually having any time to do anything. And, and I ended up in a Europe, Middle East, and Africa role. So I was always traveling with, with taxi, airport, hotel, meeting, taxi, airport, home. And so I, I didn't do anything for the longest possible time. And... Uh, all my weekends were consumed with my daughter at the time. I'm a, I'm a Saturday dad. So I was back and forth with my daughter and had no time for anything. And then she went to university. And I said, well, what am I going to do now? I've got all this spare time. And she said, well, get a bloody hobby, dad. So I did. And I bought a DSLR. And, and I haven't looked back. I, I remembered the passion I had as a teen and, and dived in headfirst and, and shoot everything as you can tell uh, and that's one of the feedbacks i get actually from when i do talks is wow you shoot everything i'm like yeah um and, and what what defines my photography and, and i guess it comes back to i'm an engineer really 
Uh, that's what I did for the longest time, engineering, product management, IT, technology. So I'm a read the manual guy from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. Oh, it does that. Oh, it can do this. Oh, I, I love that. Uh, and uh, uh, I think one of your previous guests, I think, um, uh, who's a wedding tog, um, said, uh, I've never met anybody that knows so much about the technicalities of taking pictures. And so my stuff is very technical in that I try to have everything absolutely pin sharp, absolutely perfectly exposed, absolutely perfect background. And, and that clinical square box of perfection kind of is where I try to live. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, have missed out on a lot of creative areas around Photoshop and those kind of things. So trying to, trying to learn those. So that's, you know. how, how did you find the transition after taking you know a bit of a break you know a few years out of having photography going back to then getting a dslr how was that transition from manual to dslr for you um it, can i make it i tell an embarrassing story always uh, I, bought, I bought a 450d right, a canon because I, I liked it i felt nice in my hand and i bought a 70 to 300 zoom lens and i went to my local park and I lived outside Bushy Park, where all the deer are. And so fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I stood there looking for the zoom button for the lens because I'd used a point and shoot and hadn't used anything for forever and mm-hmm. forgot completely that actually you turn the thing on, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the nerve ring on the lens. And I was just, oh, like, what are you doing? This is just crazy. But for me, to be able to really put the two worlds together of a camera that you could control the exposure and see what you got on the back of the camera afterwards was a revelation that mm. just I, I could do crazy high key and low key and actually see what i'm doing for me was fantastic and uh, i think that just opens your mind up to the the whole what what's in front of me versus what's on the back of the camera i find most people struggle with mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't have an issue with that doing something amazing and creative like kirsten does with these you know 300 prop things with him floating in the air playing his guitar mm-hmm. and those things. that's where my brain doesn't work and that's now the bit that i'm actually learning at the moment to, to try and do some really interesting and different things with the photography i'll take because all of the composite things, everybody says, I wish I had the raw ingredients that you do of this perfectly exposed, perfectly sharp mm. person or backdrop or, or whatever to glue together. And so that's where, where I am is trying to learn those things. So it's kind of interesting. It's interesting because, um, <clears throat> you know, for me, it's, um, I've sort of, I've always uh, backwards engineered things, you know, so I've always, um, thought of an idea and then backwards engineered it and sort of try to figure out, you know, for instance, like I want to shoot, you know, I have this idea for this particular photo and then I'm going to work out, okay, so what is the aperture I need to use for that? How do I need to light it? What's the shutter speed got to be? You know, so um, so it's, it sort of starts with the idea. And for me, that's um, that's been an important part for, for the learning process for me because I've learned a lot backwards engineering this. And then also, of course, you know, looking at other uh, at other photographers' work and thinking, how did they do this? And of course, as you get better and as you learn, you understand light and you understand how something must have been lit and what modifier must have been used, and um, and you kind of you can sort of deduce what the camera settings would have been approximately, you know, yeah. in terms of shutter speed and depth of field and everything. And uh, and that's and I love doing. I still love doing that. Um, I love doing that to the to the point where I've actually. I've taught my daughter, who's uh, nine now. Um, so this goes back quite a few years. She must have been maybe five or six. We used to, I remember um, we were set at a, a train station in Germany and there was a movie poster, you know, like one of the advertising billboards. And it was an ensemble cast. It may have been um, like a Marvel superhero movie or something. There were different characters on the poster. And you could clearly see in the eyes that the catch lights were all different. They were in different places and they were differently shaped. And so I taught her how to identify different modifiers just by looking at the shape of the catch eyes, right? <laughs> and since then, <laughs> this is a running joke, but whenever we come past a poster of any description, she'll always analyze the catch lights. And she'll, now, she'll tell me now at the age of nine whether these people were really in the studio at the same time or <laughs> <laughs> this is just a composite. <laughs> oh, it's so funny, and 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 it, it, it kind of that in a way for me, mm. 
it links back in two different ways. One to the the, the lecturing that I'm doing at the minute, all, mm. it, all around the country. I'm talking to Formby on Thursday. I've done one, multiple clubs in Wales and Scotland and Essex and South Coast and all kinds of crazy places that we'd never be able to do without Zoom, which which is kind of interesting. Yeah. But one of the things that I talk about is, is a process to get a shot. And it's about being inspired and, and, and being passionate. And, and the problem is that when you start, you don't know what you don't know. So you exactly. wander around, you point your camera, everything, and you just take a picture. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it's a great way to learn. And then you go through this journey where you get better and better and better. And then you sort of, your enthusiasm wanes. And at the end of it, you're sort of like, well, I'll go out and I'll have a wonder. And if there's something there, I'll point the camera at it. And, and, and I think that bridge, that gap in the middle is the hardest thing to do. And it's got, got to be about inspiration. And, and it is about, wow, look at that shot. Isn't that amazing? I want to do that. Mm. And it could be, I just want to replicate it. You know, yeah. the, the, I mean, as a judge. I, I must have seen pictures of the Millennium Bridge with, with St. Paul's there about a million times. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and they're, they're all done from slightly different angles and some are monochrome and some are colour and, and, and they're all different, but people want to go and recreate and that's okay. And then you see portraits and you think, yeah, I've seen that before. Uh, I do the British photographic exhibitions and those kind of things. Maybe we'll come back to that. But I will see the same picture of a clown 20 times from 20 different people because it was done at a workshop. Yeah. And I say, look at those and think, now that's really cool. What else could I do? How do I take an idea and spin it for me that makes it mine? Yeah. Do it somewhere else. Do it with a different kind of model, but use the techniques. Mm. But that inspiration has to be the start of all of the perspiration that follows afterwards. Yeah. Where do I go? When do I go? I mean, Terry and I, uh, my girlfriend is a photographer as well, which helps because we both go out at crazy o'clock and we don't have someone foot tapping next to us saying, come on. You've been here 30 seconds now that you've taken four pictures already today. Let's go. <laughs> Wait, we can spend hours. <laughs> this is this is the part that my wife needs to watch right now. <laughs> right, that part. <laughs> She'll probably call in though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. And it's normal, right? It's normal, yeah. everyday people. We don't have that problem. So we get up at 4 a.m. to drive to Osea Island because the beach huts are standing out of the water only between about 5 a.m. and about 5.20 a.m. <laughs> because that's when the time is there. So learning what do I want, where do I have to go for it, when do I want to do it, do I want sunrise, do I want sunset, where do I get the light mm. coming from this particular direction, all that needs thinking about. If you don't, unless you take a light modifier yourself, you, you've got to rely on, on the sun or, or similar. So all of those elements have to come together exactly as you say, to say, this is the shot I want. This is what are the elements I need to make it happen. And you've got to plan for that. Otherwise, it's just mm. yeah, luck and hoping that, that it will happen. Yeah. Um, and, and that's tough for people to learn, I think. Mm. That you, you know, like any other hobby, um, one, you have to practice it. Um, and, and, you know, I always ask the golfers, how often do you play? Oh, uh, yeah, we'll get out four times a year. Well, how good at golf are you? No, not very. How often do you go out with your camera? Well, four times a year. How good are you with your camera? Yeah. So knowing your camera, knowing your settings, knowing your lighting, and going with the right model to the right location, with the right gear, with the right lighting, and then knowing how to shoot it. It's not a click your fingers and it happens. So it takes passion. And, and I think that's the bit that people have to put into it is that, that passion and an enthusiasm well there's certainly uh, this is something i've learned you know from from speaking to you because we spent many evenings in the pub Chip. <laughs> yeah. nuttering about photography related things but it's, it's certainly one of the things i've learned um you know from like from talking to you and, and other people um is that you know as a as a photographer i typically work in controlled environments where I control everything. I control the lighting, I control the model of the subject that I'm that I'm shooting, I control the camera settings and everything else. Um, 
when when it comes to shooting landscapes, for example, or nature, there are a lot of elements you cannot control. And and so you have to learn to be in tune with those. And um, this is only really something I, I, I'm personally discovering because I'm not much of a landscape photographer. And, and actually, this was my plan was this year, well, 2020, um, you know, that was, that was my goal really because we planned to go to Canada and I was going to get into some landscape photography there, but obviously it didn't happen. But... Um, but so the one thing I've learned is is that you really have to start to look around you and get a sense for the environment and understand the you know the natural light and understand um, the times at which these things happen and then you just got to put yourself in the right place at the right time you know and uh, and create create a, a photograph that way that's that's quite different from being in a studio and controlling everything because you could yeah. literally do that anytime for for sure uh, and it's. It, it's an interesting process. Uh, it's really, I, I literally have just done a, a talk for the World Photographic Society uh, uh, last month on how to critique a landscape. Um, and I'm not, I, I would not call myself a landscape photographer as such. Hmm. I'm a judge of them, but I'm the person that does travel when I've been to the Faroe Islands and, you know, here, there and everywhere, trying to do interesting landscapes, Iceland and, and those kind mm-hmm. of places. and. You could, there are a certain set of tools you can take with you that will help. So things like uh, graduated filters and, uh, you know, big stoppers, little stoppers, those kind of things help. But you literally will go to a place and you have to wait for the weather. And at that point, you are. You've got to say, now, hang on, where, where's the wind coming from? Where's the sun coming from? Have I got water? How do I want to treat the water? And, and it may not be what you want. You may go and think, oh, I want mist. Well, there isn't any. Now what do I do? Mm. And, and so you've got to work with what you have to make the most of it. And you're right. You have to be very sympathetic with what you've got. Going anywhere generally at midday is the worst possible recipe for a good landscape generally. Mm. Uh, you can do things that forget around it, and, and it depends where it is. And I have cheated. And uh, I did a very long stopper shot, if very grey and minimalist at Brighton, um, with um, a, a, even a little gull perched on one of those big posts, who kindly sat there for me for long enough to be in my five-minute exposure, which was fabulous. Um, at 11.30 on a sunny, bright morning, mm. and someone said, well, what did you do? And I said, well, I've got a 10-stop filter and a six-stop filter, and I put them both in. So I'm literally shooting through welding glass at this point. You know, it's pitch <laughs> yeah. black. Um, and I got a four-minute exposure at 11.30 in the morning because mm-hmm. the clouds w- weren't really there. Nothing else was really happening. A- and uh, just a, a picture on a bright day, is, everyone goes, nah, okay, yeah. Record shot. Did you get that with your, with your phone? Mm-hmm. And you say, well, it's nothing. So you've got to also have, a, a, I think, an idea of what you can do to bring something to the environment that you're, you're given, whereas you would plan, this is the modifier, this is the, the you know, the guns we're going to use, this is the power, and I've got my one three because I want the main light, a key light, a air light, mm-hmm. or back, background light. You can't do that. Yeah. So you have to use other things to do it. And, and also some of the things like knowing when to use a one-second exposure where you've got uh, swirling water, as an example, and you don't want to lose that around things like ice when you're in Iceland is, is a fantastic look um, mm-hmm. versus I want the five minute, you know, and, and so you've got to adapt to what you've got rather than what you want. With your, I know that your two big passions are photography on the one hand and people development on the other. And I think <laughs> you kind of bring that together in uh, in your photography talks. And so... Um, how like what what uh, role does teaching play in your so yeah it, it's that? interesting isn't it I mean I uh, have been lucky enough to have been through many different courses in my career as a uh, as an IT guy if you like so I, I've had a lot of training spent on me and and therefore I have a lot of knowledge and capability mm-hmm. um, and I always hated and, and hate's a strong word but I, I it's one of those things where people t- you don't need to know that but what do you need to know that for 
And I just think, man, why would I not share? So for me, I am I'm generous with my time. My girlfriend would say I'm overly generous with my time. But I feel we should give back. I feel it's part of, I learn a lot from things like camera clubs and, and enjoying photography. Mm-hmm. And so part of me wants to give back to that. So as an individual, I run a company called Camera Days. And I do one-to-one bespoke how do you use your iPhone to actually take a proper picture, if you like, mm-hmm. um, uh, rather than just point it in a general direction and hope? Um, and the Camera Club has helped me develop that because we get a lot of new members who don't know how to use their cameras, don't know how to take a photograph, um, and, and haven't really been through the, the the thought process of art versus the technicalities because it's a science and an art and and the two have to come together generally for it to be successful um and they're they're all wanting to learn and so if someone is in that place and wants to learn i'm happy to share my time with them i do it for a fee for some people and and that works quite nicely i teach lightroom and those kind of things actually over zoom at the minute which is kind of crazy but it but it's better than nothing Hmm. So I do have a passion for kind of getting involved. I was a, a senior manager. I ran the whole of the European marketing department for um, uh, the, the core products, if you want to call it, for Cisco, which is which is a $5 billion business in Europe on its own. Mm-hmm. And so I got used to working with people and, and, and helping them develop. And that comes out of me as well of wanting to help develop the people around me who, who take an interest um, if you never ask, I probably won't go and tap on your shoulder and say, oh, you need to get better at this. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I generally, generally hint at people, maybe you should look at, but I wouldn't force myself on them. And so a lot of the pieces that I learn, I put together in a couple of different talks that I now give to camera clubs. And, and it started doing it for our folks and teaching a 101, you know, very American term, but photography 101 of you know, learning the exposure triangle and what does ISO do and what does an F-stop do and all those kind of things, but then trying to help our members apply them in a creative way because just because you know it doesn't mean you do anything with it. Um, You know, we all know, or some of us know, that I can use 10 different settings to get exactly the same exposure and maybe more, Um, but it's which is the right one for the, the, the look, the feel, the the, the the, the, the image that I want, knowing how to apply them creatively is where it comes. So when I look back and think I did that as a business to develop my people, I did it to, to give back to them. I now do the same in camera club. So as you say, I got roped in to be the president of Watford Camera Club. And I did that. <laughs> it was kind of roped in. I wasn't a lot of choice. And I did it for three years and I, and I ran it like a business. Um, and you know when you run a camera club it should be there for the members not for you as the person running it's not my hobby horse to do what I want it's actually for me to engage with the members and say what is it you want and which we did And, and we were in a I guess a little bit of a sticky situation with the camera club. We had some turnover of members. There were some, I think, things forced on them. And I did it the complete opposite way, complete transparency. Everybody gets involved in the decisions. And I think you've seen the difference at Watford. Mm -hmm. And for my sins, I'm now the chairman of the Chiltern area of camera clubs, which is 41 camera clubs between kind of Ealing and Hampshire House, I guess, in the bottom right corner, mm-hmm. out to Reading, almost, not quite Reading, Whitley, Whitney maybe, all the way up to Oxford and then across to Milton Keynes. That's sort of our patch of camera clubs. And I'm trying to bring some of the transparency and learning and, and growing to that now as well by mm-hmm. educating the judges and helping them get better at what they do. Um, in, in knowing that, Myself, I mean, I've been the judge for six years, um, which gets back to that. I can see the cat's light. I know whether you did like this or not. And, oh, by the way, I can see where you cut that out, and I can tell what you did that. And and people are amazed at how good you can get at doing that. And you've seen a camera club judge judge in action. We generally get a picture goes up on on the screen, 
you can't, sorry, you can't stay, sit there and I'm just looking at it and thinking about it. The mm. audience will not sit there with a 10, 15, 20 second gap. Mm. So you literally have to start talking the second it arrives on the screen and start adding some value of what you see without describing the image, mm. what's good and what works about the image, the emotion, the atmosphere, the story, or maybe just the technicalities. And then what doesn't work Mm. And then, of course, bringing in the what could you do better or differently next time in the photography, the processing, the fact that you did it in monochrome or a print versus a PDI, all of those elements. And, and it, it's, quite, it's quite a rush to do it, but it's also very, very difficult. And I know, Kirsten, you're considering it and thinking about it. It is one of the most rewarding things to do ever, but it is also one of the most challenging things I've ever done um, live in front of 50 people that you don't know, yeah. some of which may have been photographers for 60 or 70 years. And I think, I think you know, when when it comes to um, when it comes to being a, a camera club judge um, and judging images in in general, you know, some some people might say, well, you know, how can art be judged? And you know, it's uh, but but the reality is, I think that for uh, for a large part. There really is an educational opportunity in there because, especially from a technical side, and you know, I think <clears throat> there is that kind of there's an argument to say, and I, I really use that all the time. Well, I, I say that all the time, and I, um, you know, is is that of course ultimately um, the one thing that you can't really judge as as a as an image judge, as it were, is the intent behind the image. However, there are a lot of technicalities that are you know, uh, very useful for the original photographer to, to learn about. And, and ultimately, when you look at a camera club as a learning environment, then this is extremely useful. And I mean, I s certainly um, from my own experience with camera, because, you know, I've been a member of a camera club uh, only for a few years, and, and really I didn't know anything about camera clubs before that. I had no idea what that, what that even was, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, you know, I've, I've certainly uh, learned a lot, not necessarily by putting my own Im uh, images in, um, but but just by watching and listening to the judge talk about other images that pop up, and that's really been um, a very helpful, you know, in a number of ways, especially with when, when it comes to uh, areas of photography that I'm not particularly confident in or that I didn't have a lot of knowledge. Like um, macro photography is another one that I really not, knew nothing about and still know nothing about, really, other than you know, other than what I've um, what I've been able to uh, to pick up. At the camera club, and of course, again, for me, it's always been that opportunity. I always, you know, this is always my thinking, or has always been my thinking. It's like, oh, you know, if I want to learn about something specific, I've got some questions. It's like I got to talk to Martin about this in the pub, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and it, it's funny because we don't we don't explicitly state that it is an education, but you're exactly right, it is. And, and I I try to explain to some of the newer members, watch what they say about every single image. What would you do? Is the judge right? And when you first start, I, I will say, I, I, the first time I ever saw, a, let's call it a proper judge in air quotes, right? Yeah. There's no such thing. Um, I was amazed at, at the, the, the encyclopedia of knowledge that came out about all the different genres of photography, the processing, the taking, exactly as you say. And I sort of thought, wow, that's fantastic. And then you watch eight or nine different judges that all have a slightly different style. They focus on different things. Some of them are really good at picking up the, 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 the minute technicalities. Some of them are good at, at pointing out in portraiture, this is what we really are looking for and, and will give a, a really great education on a, a particular genre. Um, and so after that first year, you think, oh, did I actually learn anything? And then the judge starts with this, that, you know, I like this and I like that. And you think, well, actually, no, I disagree. Huh? And you think, oh, am I allowed to do that? And of course you are. <laughs> and it's because you now have a vocabulary to describe, because that's one of the other things I think that, yeah. that people struggle with. Well, that's a nice picture. Well, okay, that's one way to describe it. But what, what, what else can you say? As a building of a vocabulary of, of the whole, all of the, the, the intent, the technicality, the atmosphere and everything else is difficult. So that helps. And then by year three, you're probably nodding or guessing the score before it even gets there. So you have absorbed all of that knowledge without necessarily 
consciously being taught it in a lesson. Yeah, and I, I think it's reinforcement is everything. One lesson doesn't really help you. They, they say you've got to practice it seven times for it to become a thing. But when you hear a judge say the rule of thirds, not always applicable, but look works in this case, and you hear that a hundred times, when you go out and you point the camera at something, you think, now, do I want the tree in the middle? Or actually, do I want to put it on one side of it? Where do I? Oh, hang on. It looks better that way. Click and they take the picture. So hopefully it affects the way you think about the pictures that you, you're taking at that point so that you can compose them appropriately. And, and the intent one, that's a really interesting kind of topic. We teach the course of, of the Camera Club Judge, which is just a dip in the water, really. And one of the things is, why do we think the photographer took this? And, and when you ask yourself that question, when you see a picture, sometimes it slaps you in the face like a sledgehammer, and you're like, I know exactly what that's all about. And other times you go, and your head's going, and you're... Your chin scratching, and you, you, there's no obvious reason why they took it. And they're the really difficult ones. And I think teaching have a story is actually something that, that I think camera clubs need to do more of. I think the, the, the pretty picture probably is the most common reason why you took it. Oh, isn't that bird lovely? Click. Yeah. Oh, look, isn't, isn't that landscape sunset? Wow, click. Yeah. I see, this, that's really um, that's one of the one of the things I think uh, that you know we we touched on earlier when we when we uh, talked about creativity, is that um, it's often said that anyone can take a pretty picture, but the story behind the picture is uh, is often really what makes it outstanding, and it's it's that storytelling element um, in it that's important, and that's you know. Um, that's one of the one of the reasons I like to um, you know dress sets and use lots of accessories in it, and all, because all of these things tell a story. And you put them all together, and you get an environment. You kind of you know you kind of it, it helps describe what's going on in the in the image. Um, and, and of course, that's very different from you know point, pointing a um, a camera at a bird and, and taking a shot. Although, even with that, um, you know, there, there's a lot. There are a lot of things that I mean. It takes it takes a lot to take a really good image of of a bird. Is what I've learned because I didn't know anything. I mean, I don't even know. I don't know any. I don't know bird A from bird B. Do you know anything about birds? No, no, I don't <laughs> like taking photos of them because I can't do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's it. I mean, you know, one one of the things I learned, for example, right, I'll give you this. So, um, it never occurred to me that the interest in an image of a bird is not the bird itself, but what the bird does. And this is one of the things that, that gets mentioned a lot. It's the action that really matters. What's the bird doing? Is it like, I don't know, eating a thing or, you know. Um, and that's, uh, that, in a sense, um, flipped a few switches in, in, in my head at one point because I thought, like, that's right. It's not about just displaying a picture. It's about the action within it or the implied action within it. And and a lot of time in, in my portraiture, um, that's something I'm trying to bring across is actually the implied action or the story, you know, the storytelling aspect behind it. So, um, so a lot of these, a lot of these uh, aspects of photography are really work across the whole spectrum. You know, no matter whether you're talking about yeah, and you know, for sure, or whatever. And, you know, um, behavior is critical. Mm. Um, getting a bird eating a grub because that's what it does is what the the where the expertise comes in of knowing where to be, when to be, having the right gear, getting the exposure right, getting a beautiful background, all those kind of things. But hang on a second. What about sports photography? Well, I, I want the moment of the, the correct moment of action. It's a fast moving subject. I need to freeze it. I've got to be there at a right, the right point. I need a clean background. I want to see the eyes and the face because that makes the difference. I want the expression and I want the, I want it to be, you know, more than someone kicking a ball, you know, mm. I want someone being tackled and, you know, expressions on face it. Mm. Well, and isn't that sort of the same as nature? Photography, they're sort of you know, and I teach 
this and talk about it in my talk because you know there, there's no difference it's about critical moments in mm. photography you know if you go all the way back to you know Ansel Adams and and people like Elliot Elliot Irwin mm. with with his dogs and legs and those kind of things but it's about hitting that shutter when it's got its legs in a nice position you know and getting that right so the critical moment when you press the shutter is so important for you in a studio, you won't press it until you've made it exactly what you want it to be. You get that luxury. But in, as you said, in landscape, in sports, in, in street mm -hmm. photography, knowing when and how to get it as much as you can. So that critical moment, along with looking for the light, come together of, of delivering a delightful, amazing storytelling image versus, uh, well, it was a deer looking the opposite direction and there was no backlight and no breath and it just, just stood there. You say, well, that's nice versus the one that's standing there bellowing and then you've got a beautiful, you know, um, cloud of, of uh, steaming breath lit up by the backlight mm -hmm. is fantastic. So it's critical moment, light, mm -hmm. positioning of yourself versus where they are, all those elements and that's hard to teach, but you should be spotting all that as a judge when you're educating people. Look for the look for a rim light. Isn't that much better? Mm. You know, don't just do a you know stand in front with the you know blasting sun on it, so it's all just lit up and boring. Because you wouldn't do that in a studio either. You'd want the key light and <clears> some, maybe a hair light and to pop it from its background. So they're all they're all transferable skills that you should be able to bring to any genre. Hence, I shoot sports, I shoot, you know, wildlife, architecture, landscape, people, studio, uh, and, and everything, because it's fun um, and it's all learning. Right? I think you're in quite a unique position um, being a judge that particularly now you're presiding over so many different camera clubs, you must get to see oh, thousands of images <laughs> not not only every year, but probably every month, right? Yep. Are you you've mentioned quite a number of um tips and um things that you look for. Are there some common themes that you see across um photographers and perhaps even across categories that people generally are, you know, it takes them a little longer to get used to doing or or yeah. whatever it might be. Are there some common common themes that you see? Um, yeah, for sure. Um uh, the, the the most common one is there is no such thing as almost sharp. <laughs> <laughs> it's good enough. No, it isn't. It really isn't. If it's supposed to be sharp, we want it sharp. Blur is great. We love we love bokeh. We love those things. But I see so many pictures where you just think that is just that's almost sharp, but not quite. So that drives me absolutely crazy. The, the other one is the first thing you ever do when you edit an image is, you know, that saturation slider. If it's not got a zero of, of you know, when I've got 20 or 30, when we haven't moved it enough. That drives me crazy. Neon grass, electric <laughs> red umbrellas and handbags. Do you just think, no, no, vibrance, please. Just use the yeah. vibrance slider. Bring that up. Do not give me this. It looks like it's been plugged in the neon socket and the whole thing has become fluorescent. I, on, I honestly can't remember the last time I used saturation slider. I turn it down usually. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. A, I mean, that's the thing. As soon as you increase, yeah. as soon as you increase the contrast, you need to kind of take the saturation down. Yeah. Yeah. Usually. And, you know, and when like, you start, it goes that way. And when you, as you, as you go on, it goes less and less and goes more and more that way. <laughs> and you can use it to control things. You know, things like... Um, Grass can be the wrong shade of green. There is, a, there is that bright grass that's absolutely awful, whatever you do. Mm. Um, and, and Fuji shooters know it because they get it anyway, whether they like it or not. So they always have to turn the green down and <laughs> Canon shooters have to turn the red down and all those things. But um, you, you just look at it and you just, oh, and just turn the yellow down and the green just mellows out straight away. Just easy as can be. And, and that one drives me crazy. And it's because it's so simple to fix. And the other one is let's monochrome it or color pop it. Because it wasn't a great picture. And I look at it and it's not great. And I don't know what it's about. Much better in monochrome, right? It, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't great to start with. Yeah. Monochrome won't rescue it. 
and make it a suddenly a better picture. Mm-hmm. Um, used in the right way, it's fantastic. I love it. I, I, I'm a big, big, big fan of monochrome. Um, but people use it every, for everything and anything. And you just say, well, you know, there was a picture of a bike leaning against the wall and you've made it monochrome. What did you want me to look at? What, what in there was exciting or interesting? A, a, an old bone shaker and a brand new racing bike next to each other might have a story of, oh, look at those. Isn't that interesting and different? Or some, you know, juxtaposition of the cat sitting in the window. Or, you know, th- there's many things you could do to add value. Hmm. But just a bike against the wall, just because it's in monochrome, is not a better picture. Hmm. Um, well, so there's loads. You could just go on forever. Um, <laughs> it, it, you really can. It, it, you get used to seeing so much because we see lots of beginner work, and, and obviously so, but also you get people that are trying to be really creative but have lost the plot hmm. somewhere along the way. And what they, where they get so, you know, they can't see the wood for the trees anymore, and their image has just become a dog's dinner of, of processing to the yeah. point that. that what what have we done? And I guess that's that would be the last one that I've mentioned is over process. Mm. Let's replace every sky and everything with something from Luminar, as an example, and leave the white halo around the building and in the trees. <laughs> Let's oh no, the, the, the sky is too dark, too bright, so I'll put a graduated filter on, but I'll leave it on the church spire and the tree, so that's all dark and you know, and you just think, you know, some sensitivity using things like, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Lightroom now with luminosity masking in it. I do most of my stuff in Lightroom. And, and you can play with so much, but just use that based on colour or, or the luminosity of an image. Using grad filters, brushes, and all kinds of things, you can fix an image up in 30 seconds flat. You know, Photoshop uh, is uh, bringing out a sky replacement feature mm-hmm. in the next update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to see a lot of that. <laughs> well, I, 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 I like the way it's doing it, I will say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I posted it on, on the Watford page and Richie went, I don't like that. Because generally it just does it and then that's it. Mm-hmm. You can't control it. You can't edit it. It ruins it, all the edges. Yeah. You can't really do anything with it. Um, and Luminar does that. Luminar just says, there it is. Photoshop they're actually going to give you all the layers of all the masks. Mm, yeah. So they mask it all out. They put it all there for you. And the piece that I thought was very, very clever was they look at the color tonage in the sky and, and actually apply it to the foreground. So it looks mm. like they go together, unlike many I've seen where it's dull, flat, gray, more, you know, a bit of dirty grass mm. and and a flagstone, and then a beautiful sunset above it. Yeah. Think, mm. Do they really go together? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no. So, you know, but over-processing it and doing it poorly. And, and as a judge, I, I, I kind of always say the same thing. and People just groan. For me, Photoshop is like a magician. Hmm. If you get it right and you do the trick, nobody notices. Nobody knows. Yeah, you just go, wow, where did the rabbit come from? Amazing. If I can see it hanging out of your sleeve <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and the bird feathers sticking out your shirt, you spoil everything. Because I, it just... You just go, look at that, look at this, look at that, and, and it's faulted. So, yeah, those are the ones that, that drive me the craziest, I guess. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a thing called uh, camera club photography. And I was mm-hmm. I, I remember when, when I first um, joined the camera club, I was completely unaware of that term at all. It, it really didn't occur to me that there was such a thing as club photography. How do you define what club photography actually is? That's really difficult, and, and I kind of teed you up with this one a little, I think. It's, um, it's a very interesting world, photography. Um, if you go look on Flickr, 500px, take your pick, whatever, there are thousands of different photographs being delivered every second. Some of them are pure art, I would say. They're way over on the left field. You, you really need to almost know your art history to, to understand and value them. Um, and they're really interesting and unique, abstract and some of those kind of things. And then in the far right-hand corner, you have this absolute perfection of my background is absolutely beautifully blurred. My bird is on a beautiful stick with moss because I don't want it to be an ugly stick. It's got to be a beautiful stick with with a fish in its mouth. Kingfisher is often the classic. Mm -hmm. Um, So it becomes... um, 
a, a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of the rules become everything on a third wildlife will have a catch light will have sharp feathers will have this will have that whereas uh, uh, there's one particular author i'll, I'll um, name julia mullins who is at amersham a photographic society had a picture of two blurry gulls and it's fabulous it's the essence of gull it's absolutely art and i looked at it and thought this really won't do well, do well in camera clubs and a judge gave it a terrible score and i gave it 20 in first place um because you really have to appreciate the intent hmm. so and it doesn't match this perfect square square world of on a third perfectly exposed we don't want any uh, distractions at all anywhere everything has to be crisp perfect any dust spot any little oh look that twigs in the wrong spot you have to get rid of all of those things to to make it absolutely perfect in the genre that it's in and that's what i would call camera club photography i do think it's there there is a a thought process at the minute that we really need to be moving away from that. I certainly, within the CACC, am um, challenging all of the judges that we have to be thinking outside the box, to be looking for where there is obviously an artistic intent. And, and I have been known to give images that are not technically perfect first place. And, and everyone is shocked. And they say, well, you know, and I said, but no, no, look at the emotion. And I'll use um, Susan Gashak's image as an example. We did a, um, a, a prime lens challenge to f kind of help people be creative, go to a location, take pictures there with a 50 mil, zoom with your feet and come back. And she brought back an image of um, a, obviously a graduating student with all her gown on and everything. And, and I, I don't know what had happened, but it looked like she had just realized, oh my God, the world starts now. Hmm. I'm not in a university, I'm not cosseted, I'm not just in a lecture, I have to go and actually earn a living. And she had this like, you know, completely stunned look on her face and it wasn't quite pin sharp. Well, you know, Irving pens weren't always pin sharp but we all think they're amazing you know why why i know that the technology will cause them quite there back then so although i say uh, there is no such thing as almost sharp the picture has to uh, has to transcend its faults and, and i think camera club land hasn't quite got over the accepting faults but looking for emotion and atmosphere and intent mm. and that journey i think is, is starting but at the moment perfection is probably where it's at yeah. But I always say, you know, uh, because I'm I'm often asked whether you know um, whether it's a good idea to to join a camera club or you know some some people may think it's a stifles creativity, um, and I always think you know one of the best things um, I've done really certainly when I first moved to the area because that was the reason for me um, as to why I why I joined um, a camera club in the first place it was mainly because you know I moved to the area I got married and my wife said uh, you should really you know hook up with some other camera nerds <laughs> you know, that was basically and the thing for me is like well, well that was definitely one of the best things i've done um not because of the competitions necessarily um because as you know i don't necessarily really take part in those a lot but it was you know meeting like-minded people um you know talking about all things photography meeting people who have vastly vastly more experience in a particular field um than than i have and being able to to really you know um learn a lot even if it is you know at the pub after the actual camera club meeting you know and that's that's often for me i, I always i always think like that's really where it, where it's actually happening for me it's the, that's the fun part where you can actually talk to people you know and you you, uh, yeah. you 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 know um because it's amazing you know meeting people who've been around for such a long time you know who have you know, who used to shoot on film. Well, I remember, do you remember, um, I got a 1938 Akfa um, camera, like a bellow camera, yes. um, which used to be my my, uh, my grandmother's camera, actually. And uh, and I brought it in, and one of, the, one of the club members, John, who's been around for a long time. A long time, he, yeah. Yeah, a long time, yeah. And he looked at the camera, he goes, you know, 
that was the first camera I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, what? <laughs> wow! You know, and uh, immediately you had somebody that, that could talk to you about how it worked and you know how you yeah. worked the thing because that was the thing. It's like you know, for me, I look at this and I'm like, I'm such a child of the digital age, you know, in, in a sense. Although I'm much older than that, but you know, mm. in terms of photography, <laughs> and I looked at this and I'm like, how do I take a picture with this thing? Like, how does this even? How does this work? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and it was just a, it's a great um, opportunity to to find somebody you know who you could uh, talk about all these all these things. And for me, that's been really that's been one of the greatest um, advantages uh, of of joining you know of joining a club. And yeah. um, but how do you like with COVID and everything um, happening and you know and the lockdown and the fact that. Um, camera clubs aren't able to meet in person anymore. I know some, you know, some clubs have uh, switched to Zoom, for example, to do Zoom meetings. Um, where do you think, what, what do you think the impact has been of, of that on camera clubs? Not necessarily only our local club, but, but uh, further afield. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think the meeting people and, and meeting like-minded people in any hobby is where, the creativity can come and the projects and those things. And I think COVID has in many ways thrown a little bit of a blanket over that. It's, it, we can have a conversation because we're we're one on one. Having 50 people on a call that aren't used to interacting and not interrupting each other and all trying to talk at the same time is it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, and I'm used to it because I did it in the IT land for, for, for 20 years. I've been living on video conferences and, and, and one of you. But I think it, in some ways it's been hugely negative. I really miss the pub. That's the bit I like. People ask me questions. What do you think of this? Can you have a look at this image? What about that? What about this lens? You know, and all that kind of stuff. Because it's fun and interesting. And over a point, it's great. And, and I really miss that, that camera club two part, if you want to call it, mm. that where you can ask all those questions. And, and I think that a lot of clubs have missed. However, um, Zoom, and, and I say Zoom because that's what most people are using. I, I, I'm not bigger. I've used WebEx and GoToMeeting and all those other kind of things. They all work. They're all very good. Zoom, I think, was easy to use and you didn't need to sign up. But when would I ever get to present a real camera club? When would I get to present to Formby Camera Club? Mm -hmm. How could we have, um, you know, um, David Lake, who's one of the best, you know, photographers in the country, who lives in Manchester, um, we tried to look at how much it would cost for him to come. And even if all you did was pay his mileage expenses, it's £200 mm. just to come for one night. And I I'm not driving from Manchester to Watford to do a one and a half hour presentation and drive it home again. That would be kind of crazy. So in many ways, Zoom has opened up the ability for us to gain access to knowledge and speakers that we would never have been able to get. Hmm. Um, you know, people like Ross McKelvey in Ireland, who's a, a, a fantastic um, hmm. portrait guy. Um, I actually have got him lined up to help me train the judges on how to judge portraiture, what hmm. the modern styles are, what Instagram does, why, how would you, what's the difference? Because just because it's an Instagram portrait doesn't mean it's bad. Learn to embrace that because a lot of people shoot that way and LUTs and colour grading and all that. There's no such thing as wrong in photography, apart from not sharp. And <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so we, we have access to speakers and knowledge that we would never have had. I think that the trick that we've missed and that we haven't figured out how to do yet, and I think you really helped with some of that, is let's get five interesting people on a, on a Zoom outside of the camera club and talk about how do I use a mask? What do I do with that? What do I, how do I, you know, and I, I've been pulling my hair out trying to figure out how to use brushes and how to create brushes because I want a smoky, blurry background with kicked up dust and all kinds of other things going on. And, and I've been doing it on YouTube and, and, and I, that's what I do because I know what the image is in my head. A lot of other people aren't quite there yet. So sitting down with four or five of you and saying, this is the image that I'm trying to get to, 
these are the techniques that, and the people go, oh, I could use that for something else. Um, and so it's a good way to, to continue that education and that learning process. And, and because I've been teaching Lightroom one on one to one with people, learning to use annotate and, and, and those kind of things. So you can, you know, use the little arrow to say, click there, you know, on your screen, click this, click that, you know, point up here. You can do those things interactively. So you say, no, no, look, look, share your screen, show me the image you're working on. Look at that here. Let's darken that down. Here's where you would do that. That is much more valuable in some ways than having 50 people in a room with a judge saying, look, we should darken that bit down. Um, and I think the talks, and that's the thing I think we didn't really talk about with camera clubs. It is a, a, a kind of melange of, of stuff from one-on-one one -on -one training session. So I'm doing a Lightroom one, I think in a couple of weeks, and I'm gonna do some things like easy dodging and burning and using texture, mm -hmm. both to remove maybe some age from someone without having to get into frequency separation because you know, if you go on the, the internet, the only way to improve a portrait is, is to do a full professional retouch. And not everyone is ready to do that yet, right? I mean, some people are, but, you know, trying to explain, you know, well, what's a layer is the first question that comes out. Yeah. And you're like, okay, if you don't know what a layer is, retouching is not going to help you get there. Frequency <laughs> separation, dodging and burn layers, you know, people whoosh over their head and, and they, you know, they don't get it. So, you know, being able to just take someone through it step by step on their image mm. and with three or four people watching, I think is, is a tr truly powerful thing to do. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's what I, you know, that's what our uh, photo and video chat has sort of um, developed into. Um, you know, mm. we originally, we started that just simply as a means for people to get together and talk about their frustrations of not being able to shoot uh, what yeah. they would like to shoot in, in, uh, in lockdown. And um, in over time, it's have developed into more of a um, kind of a, a Photoshop training type of a thing. It's a very relaxed thing. We always have a beer. It's all it's all good, you know. But um, it's it's really proven to be very helpful, I think, for a lot of people because you know we tackle one sort of topic a week, and um, you know it's it's a very relaxed kind of uh, kind of atmosphere. But the you know the the important part is that. Um, that people learn something and take something away from that. And because it's difficult, you, you have lots of people know lots of different little bits, you know, and everybody's got a few Legos, but nobody's able to build the house, yeah. you know, and that's, that's kind of what we're, what we're sort of aiming at is to, to give people the tools, fill in the blanks and, oh. uh, and, and just help people to utilize those, uh, those techniques to further their own creativity, you know, that's uh, ultimately think what it's all about. The, 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 I agree 100%. And I think the challenge that we've had is we didn't really have Zoom accounts and those kind of things. Sure, Most absolutely. people didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is terrible because there's no way for you to know who it's aimed at or pitched at or what software they've got. Well, just select that. <clears throat> uh, hang on a minute. How did you do that? You yeah. didn't even tell, you know, and, and I was chatting to Lloyd and saying, well, how do I get these? Oh, I don't bother with that. I do, I, you know. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. You're Mr. Composite Man. I that's why I don't do animals, he says. So the techniques aren't necessarily transferable because they say, no, oh, look, you just select this and it's a car. And they take a raw, bright red car against a, you know, a black asphalt background and they, they hit the select and it says, oh, there, there's your red car, boom. And they say, oh, yeah, we just add the tires. Done. Look at that. Perfect. Isn't it easy? And then you say, well, hang on, what about, you know, the hair? What about the feathers? How do I, oh, no, we're not covering that. We're next. And so yeah. you, you don't get that opportunity where I think an interactive small session, you can say, well, hang on, what do I, I, I can, you know, select subject, actually. It's pretty damn good. I've been doing horses, by the way, which you'll see <laughs> one in the yeah. Horses are really easy and, until they're rimlet. And then yeah. what do I do with the mane? Yeah, exactly. They're moving. They're not standing still. They're galloping. What do I do with this tail that's, you know, flipping through? How do I? And then yeah. then YouTube just is, forget it, you just, you could watch 50 videos and you get nowhere. Yeah, so what, one of the great advantages with the uh, with doing it 
you know, life on on something like Zoom is that it's uh, it's interactive. People can stop you and ask questions, um, and often, you know, often you start you start with with one thing, and then you know, somebody throws a question your way, and and you you sort of career off into something else. Um, but you know, it, it's that's really necessary because that's that's more of a you know a learning environment that that people are used to, and of course, you know, the one of the the issues generally is that different people learn in different ways. And whilst for one person, for example, uh, watching a video on YouTube might be just the perfect way to learn, um, for other people need that interaction. And I think um, it's a really great, you know, it's a great medium. I think, you know, for us, it was it was the realization that that actually, you know, we can offer more than, than just ha- having a relaxed chat about you know how how to be creative. Um, you know how to utilize your your camera at home. Although in the beginning that was important because because people felt like they were in this rut, um, and it def- it definitely kind of um, did a service. You know in that, in that respect. Um, but then later on it became clear that you know maybe we can actually go beyond that. You know maybe we can do something something that's even of more value to uh, to people. And it's been you know it's turn it's a good crack. I mean you know. Oh, it is, and, and I, I've uh, unfortunately for me, I'm normally talking, judging, or something else, so I don't get to go to very many of them. But occasionally okay. I do, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they are they're immensely rewarding. And I know it, it's kind of the 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 whole um, oh god, the Dunning Dunning Kruger effect, right? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Do you know, guys know what the Dunning Kruger effect is? No, no. <laughs> oh, well, okay. This is kind of a classic. This it's nothing to do with photography, actually, but photography is perfect for it. Hmm. So, whenever you start something, whatever it is, whether it's coding, whether it's learning photography, whatever it is, you you start, and you have no idea what minefield you're about to walk into, hmm. and your mum says, "Oh, that's a lovely picture, dear," on your and your friends all go, "Oh, that." So, oh my God, I'm a photographer. I am amazing. I've been doing this. I've got every camera a week. Um, right, I'm going to be doing baby shoots next week. And uh, a friend of mine has asked me, can I do a wedding? Well, fantastic, because you don't know what you don't know. So your your kind of expertise level is here, mm. but your expectation level is up here. Mm. And over time, as you start to learn, and you start to realize that actually I've got 27 Legos, but but Ross McKelvey's got 350 Legos, hmm. you, you, your expectation goes down because you people say, are you all right? Do you take a good picture? I will say, well, I'm all right. I'm learning. I'm, I, I, you know, and they're like, bloody hell, your stuff's great. I'm like, yeah, but I, I know how good other people's are. So you, you're, you kind of drop down over time. Mm. And I think that's the challenge is that people don't know what they don't know. And yeah. so having that small group where you start with what you think is where everyone is, and then they realize that, well, I don't know how to even make a layer. What is a layer? I don't even know what that is, you know, in things like Photoshop. Or, I mean, I um, was out watching a couple of our beginners when we were out on a photo shoot. And I said, well, what F-stop do you think you'd want for that? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, what depth of field do you want for this shot? Mm. Well, um, I don't know. Well, I want all of it in focus. So what are you set at? Well, I don't know. Hang on, let me have a look. And they look on the back of the camera and you say, oh, okay, oh, F4. Well, that's your load down. You're quite close to the ground. You're probably not going to get a lot of depth to fill. Maybe F8. All right, hang on a second. Hmm. Press the quick button on the back and it all comes up. Then they tap the bit where it says the F-stop and then they move the wheel till it says F8 and then they press set and then they pick it up and, they, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did you do all that? What do you mean? Well, you do know that wheel under your finger when you're in AV, because you're in AV. You just move that and it goes F4, 5.6. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. Yeah. So their expectation is, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm taking pictures and I'm brilliant. But some of those basic skills get skipped along the way mm-hmm. because you don't know you should know them. But actually, you should. And uh, we had um, Mark Payne who um, came and talked to Watford Camera Club. He's uh, World Sports Photographer of the Year, uh, Olympics Photographer of the Year, the, the, the year they did the Olympics. And his imagery, a couple of our members said, oh, sports, oh, I knew it was going to be boring, and they really weren't. They were imaginative. They were interesting. Mm. He was the person, I, I don't know if you know the story, uh, Jose Mourinho was sent off at Chelsea for the football people out there, sent off, leave the pitch, 
and he's like, whoa, what the hell? And, and they sent him up into the stands. And so he had to go and stand with all the Chelsea fans because there was nowhere else for him to go. No, it never happened before. Mm. And, and Mark turned his camera around and thought, I don't really care about the game. That's not the story. Back to intent again. If I think it was Crystal Palace. If Crystal Palace score a goal, nobody cares, right? Apart from 20,000 Palace fans, right? <laughs> so I'll watch Mourinho and Chelsea scored. And he got a picture of Jose Mourinho going, we are scored with, with like surrounded by this sea of Chelsea shirts and fans going, mad. And it's insane what happened to it. It's on the back of the Times, it's on the back of the mirror, it's on the back of the sun, because it was the picture from the event. Hmm. And so we said to him, what's the one thing you really should know? And he said, your camera. Because if you're faffing around going F-stop, quick button, you just miss the goal. So learning to do it all while you're looking through the viewfinder, not for everything, but can I change my AF mode? Can I change my F-stop? Can I add exposure confidence? You know, all those things. But you don't know that when you start. So your expectation level is you're fantastic, but actually as you learn, you start to realise that yeah. it's a Dunning-Kruger and it works that, for every endeavour you do. That period right there is a really critical point for someone learning because it's very easy to get discouraged by, oh, God, I don't know that, I don't know that. Yeah. Christ, my fact is aren't really as good as I thought they were. And it's like, oh, can I really be bothered? And that you have to push yourself past that hurdle. Mm. Yeah, and I, so you, then you're on to a whole different stage of your your development at that point. You are, and then you're you're away for another X period of time. And there's a big tip I would give for anyone that, that goes through that, because we all do it. Mm-hmm. Save your early images. Don't delete them all. Don't get rid of them all. Don't think, oh, they're all junk, I'm gonna get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Keep some. Because one of the biggest issues is we get to uh, where we're a year past where we were. Uh, am I, I'm, I'm stuck in a rut, I'm not doing it, I'm rubbish, right? I'm mm. going nowhere. And we all, the head goes down and the enthusiasm goes and time out. Mm. Go look at your flicker stream from a year ago, or two years ago, and mm. you go, did I really post that online? <laughs> oh my God, that's atrocious. And I've yeah. got two flicker streams and I looked at my old one and I just was like, oh my God, I, I, thank God I've hidden it all. It's terrible. Yeah. Nothing sharp. Everything's flat, and I'm, you know, it's yeah. just that. And I look at that and I think, okay, maybe I'm actually learning something. And and so, you know, suddenly you you, you feel a lot more enthused because you realise those small steps are still making a difference. So yeah. that's the big tip: yeah. keep your old stuff so you can refer back and see the journey you have made. That's because- a really great way of doing it. Um, I used to do exactly the same thing uh, when I was a kid. And I, I was, uh, you know, I used to when, when I was learning how to play the guitar. And uh, I would, I would come up with a riff. You know, I would learn a riff or whatever, a piece of a solo or whatever. And I'd I'd practice it, and to the point where I think like, man, this this sounds awesome. You know, and I kind of thought I'd, I'm the dog's bollocks or whatever. And I would record it on one of those old dictaphone things that my dad yeah. had lying around. You know, it was old back then. You know, micro what was it called? Micro tapes. Do you remember those? Like yeah, I did. Yeah, but they, they sounded crap, but yeah, that's what I had. So, and I would record the riff that I was playing and I would take the tape and I would put the tape in a shoebox and I would leave it in the shoebox for at least six months, sometimes much longer than that. And then after six months or after a year, I would listen back to it. And the same recording that I thought was the dog's bollocks earlier now sounds horrible because of course you've developed over that time. You've gotten better and your ears have developed. You listen back to it. Like, How did I ever think this was any good? <laughs> like, you know, deluded. And, and, and the same exact thing happens with uh, with 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 your photographs. All you've got to do is just go back on your like on your um, Facebook feed. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah look at it. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I post quite a lot of images uh, on Facebook, uh, in particular. Maybe maybe not so much um, on Instagram, but um, but it is actually a really good measure of of how how yeah. you've improved. And it, it's really hard to to be. Let's be really honest. We're very emotional about our images, uh-huh. all of us, right? Yeah. We're all precious. We all think they're the best thing ever. And it's really hard to be told they're not. Yeah. And and so we get so absorbed in what we see in front of us in our image. We're like, oh, it's amazing. And then in a year's time, exactly as you say, you look back and you think, did I really post that? And and it's because we, we just, that context of that moment, mm-hmm. uh, it's what you know. And, and what you know in a year will be very different to where we are now. Yeah. And, 
of course. so it just gets you over that. Uh, I'm not improving. I'm not getting better. Oh no, you know, what am I going to do? Because we all suffer from that. And, and let's be really honest in any art form, whether it's playing a guitar, hmm. taking a picture, we're all precious. We all want to be better. We all want to take, make the best art we can. Yeah. And therefore we get very despondent when we don't. And, and sometimes you need someone else to tell you that's great and, and listen to that. But other times you need to look at your own work from a year ago and say, Ashley, I have improved. Yeah, that's exactly why I'm married to my wife. Because <laughs> <laughs> she'll, she'll, she look at, she look at my images. <laughs> Kay, and, that's crap. What are you doing? <laughs> and that, well, pretty much. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, this is a, it's a, it's a real, um, it's sobering though. And I actually quite like it. I, I make fun of it, but, but I like yeah, it. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I'll put a lot of time and effort into creating something and um and i'll show it to her you know being like super proud and she'd be like yeah yeah it's all right, it's all right. Is, that, She's got- is that when you flip the monopoly board and go oh what do you know <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> i slap you with my white glove but, yeah. and it's you know and that's the other thing is i always you know we we have the same chink and terry's daughter Mm. We say, what do you think of that? And she said, oh, a bit dull. What's <laughs> <laughs> when I was on that? And you yeah, know, yeah, I exactly. from what, 20 miles to take it and nobody cares. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. You know, and, and, and that's one of the other things as a judge I've had discussions with, and it kind of does come to it. I only care about what you put in front of me. Mm. It's the image. That's all that counts. I really, you know, you look at people like Thomas Heaton and, and people like that that do the landscape thing. Mm-hmm. And he yeah. says, yeah, I've walked 14 miles to get up to this bit. And I'm like, I really don't care. <laughs> it, it, it means nothing. You know, it, it doesn't. Unfortunately, yeah. all we can see is what you put on the wall. Mm. And, and then you get all these people, oh, you shouldn't use a phone. It's got to be a proper camera. And I'm like, if I print that out and put that on the wall, can you tell? Well, uh, 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 no. And so it should be about the final result. And you look at, mm. you know, Picasso and Rembrandt and all those guys, they had to learn. They worked really hard for their art. They had yeah. people saying, that's crap. What are you doing? It's rubbish. You know, look how dark and horrible that is. And look how much we love a moody Rembrandt now. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, you know, we can only tell the final product, really, of what, is it, you know, fantastic, not, or, or, you know, and I don't care whether you walked 15 miles or laid in, you know, bird poop for, for an hour and I've done all those things because that's kind of par for the course, right? And you don't get marks, you know, for, for the effort. You get marks for the quality of the picture yeah. and uh, whether it's pure art or, or camera club or anywhere in between, you know, the effort in is really important because it does make a difference on the results out. Yeah. But in a way, it's irrelevant because nobody actually knows how hard it was for you to get there. Yeah. Um, in whatever you know endeavor whether it was in a studio or a you know a, a blue-footed booby in the galapagos islands nobody really sort of cares right it's mm. show me the picture what was your favorite ever uh, photography trip favorite ever um oh many many from for many different reasons but but i but i think probably the the top of them all was um, going to Lake Kirkini in Greece mm-hmm. in the winter with snow and ice um, to photograph the Dalmatian pelicans because mm-hmm. um, they're amazing. They're they're huge, great big things. They're they're just insane to look at and watch. Uh, and the trip was just fantastic. The the birds played ball every day. Uh, we got lots and lots of pictures. Too many, too many to bore everybody to tears with them all. Uh, and I got a couple that are just outstanding and have won gold medals all over the world. Um, you know, in print competitions and PDI competitions. One of them has won nature and landscape and colour competitions, even though it's a picture of a bird on a lake. But to, you know, okay, um, and. Because I sat there and put my camera down after I'd taken, it's called Dalmatian Pelican Sunset. It's one of my favourite, favourite pictures. And uh, Vasilis, who was driving the boat, said, oh, you, you finished. And I'm like, yeah. It was the last day on the last night of the trip that the sun had gone down and we were sitting in Alpine Glow. So it, it, you had like a blue and pink sky and it was reflected on the water. And then this one single Dalmatian pelican is just 
sat there looking delightful and lovely uh, and the snow on the mountains in the background. And mm. so you've got to remember, and, and this is about, you know, get into the location. Sometimes you just need to put the camera down and enjoy where you are as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it shouldn't just be about, you know, I, I took 50,000 pictures, but I don't know where I was or it didn't really matter because all I cared about was that. Mm. So for me, image wise, I got some stunners. Uh, Location-wise, was just one of the most beautiful places on the planet, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and from an emotion perspective, at the end of the trip, was just sublime. So, yeah, that's probably why. Mm. Wow. I don't think I've ever considered going to Greece in the, in the winter. It's true, yeah. Next I love the, love the sound of it. That sounds incredible. It's right up in the north, right up mm. against Bu- is it? It's not Budapest. It's um, one of the Balkan countries. Mm. And snow on the mountains and the river had frozen. And, mm. oh, it's fantastic. But mm. it's the best time to go to get the Dalmatian pelicans. So mm. that's where you go. I don't know there um, pelicans in Greece. No, no, I didn't know. Yeah, oh, it's incredible. And they're a very particular breed. That's the thing. They're not. They 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 kind of live along that strip. On, or if you took the globe, they kind of live along that strip and nowhere else. Oh, wow. And um, oh. it, it, there's a it's a it's a small lake with a big river, oh. um, which kind of is weird. That's how they explain it. It's like a mile across and like four miles long, but it has a really big river that flows through it. Oh. So it's having new fish dumped in it all the time. So, it, so the pelicans eat a lot. They really, you know, they like to feed, fill their tums. And so it, for, for the fishermen that live there and the, 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 the pelicans, there's a lot of food. A lot of food equals a lot of wildlife. And uh, if you go at any other time of year, you can get glossy ibis and, and um, uh, lots of buzzards and, and herons and purple night herons and mm. all kinds of other crazy breeds that we don't get in the UK. So um, mm. good fun. So you mentioned some um, you mentioned some international uh, print um, competitions. For anybody who uh, is interested in taking part in um, in competitions, uh, is, there, is there anything you would recommend to somebody who said like, "Oh, you know what? This sounds I like the sound of that. I would like to uh, enter images into competitions." Is there any are there like particular uh, competitions that you might recommend or? Um, yeah. Um, so the, 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 there's sort of well, there's lots of them really. So there's there's the what I call the potties, the, the photographer of the year. So there's a w- landscape one, a wildlife one, a garden one, a, uh-huh. a pet one. A, you know, there, there's all kinds of things like that. And, and they're hard to win. But you could sometimes get through and normal people do do well in them. And generally, they range in many, many different subjects. And you can Google whatever you're passionate about. So if you only have access to gardens or you happen to like pottering around, you know, um, National Trust places, that might be a good place to start. Mm. For the what what I would call the salons and exhibitions, there are a set of UK ones that you have to live in England to be, or sorry, live in the UK to to participate in, Mm. uh, called the British Photographic Exhibitions, the BPEs. And there are a set of international ones, one run by FIAP, um, which is the, the Federation International, uh, who are a worldwide governing body. And there's some run by the PSA, which is the Photographic Society of America. And it depends what you take and what you shoot. But the first step is go Google it and find some results mm-hmm. and look at what is needed to be successful. And I'll use, so things like both the Basingstoke BPE, um, uh, South Birmingham BPE, if you just Google those things, you'll find them. And they have the results online so you can see them. And the piece that I really enjoy about it is they have a creative section for people that love Photoshop. They have a nature section for people that love nature. Color, monochrome, scapes, people. So whatever you take there is somewhere that your genre will fit because trying to win a a, a landscape competition with a portrait is never going to happen right so if you only take portraits you need a section that you can play in and look at what works and what doesn't and you can do that internationally and within the uk so one of the classic examples is if you take a picture of a swan and you put it in an exhibition without some kind of really creative thing around it. It's another bloody swan. And it will never do anything because it's a swan. 
But if you entered a swan in China, China doesn't have swans. China thinks swans are amazing. And a local guy won the Chinese nature competition with two swans in flight, backlit, beautiful background. It was lovely. But every time you put it anywhere in the UK, uh -uh, no, just not interesting. And so, you know, when you're ex exhibiting in Serbia, France, Germany, the work that does well could be completely different. And so you've got to look at what does well and what doesn't well. I know my style of photography, which is very clean, clinical, you know, all those things I said earlier, in Germany, Switzerland, Serbia, Montenegro, Poland, I run riot. I, I think I got 23 out of 24 acceptances, three or four different medals, and you get a pin for being the most successful author in one of those competitions. But I would take those same, same images and I would enter them in India and I'd get four acceptances out of 24 because culturally they don't translate and they don't like them and those mm. kind of things. So know your audience, I think, is probably the summation of that. Mm. Go look at what does well. And it's I, I would say as a source of inspiration, it's really helped my photography. When I first did my first ever BPE, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I'd try it. I got three acceptances. And I thought I put 12 images in and I got three. That's rubbish. But actually, that's very good for the first time you ever do it. And I didn't do it for like a year or two. And we were looking for an outlet for all these pictures we take. Where can we, let's do the BPEs. And I put a whole bunch of what I thought was great stuff in and I got one. And, and thinking, oh, my God. And when I actually really did my research, the, the, the bar is really up high. You know, it, it's they're looking for the for what I call exhibition class photography that is more than the average, you know, picture that does okay in a camera club. And so, yeah, I had to step my game up a lot. And, and I learned a lot and it pushed me, which sometimes is what you need to kind of help motivate yourself you need a project and so you know i have a chunk of letters after my name um just because you can um you know by entering exhibitions and entering you know uh, things like the dpagb and those kind of things where you have to put up 15 exhibition class images and they rate them as yes no or maybe and if you don't get enough yeses you don't pass mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're, but it's a project and I had to shoot for it, and I had to go find some extra images that I wanted. And, and so it's a, a, it helps with that motivation of, what am I going to take a picture for? Just for me, can I be bothered? And um, the BPEs and the fee apps, they're, they're every month. So you've got, oh, I need some more images now, and I need some more titles, and because they have restrictions on, you've used it once, you can't use it again. So, you know, you've got to have a new title now in the monochrome section. And so it just could, becomes... I don't want to use the word treadmill in a bad way, but a treadmill in a good way of there is an expectation of a ticking clock of the next exhibition closes in a month and I need three more images. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? I need two new monochromes. I need a new nature. And so it, it pushes you yeah. to, to go do things that maybe you didn't before, which is I think is great. It works for me uh, as a way to help motivate me for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we found during the uh, during lockdown was that we set ourselves challenges. Um, and so we came up, like, as part of the podcast, we came up with, you know, a little, our own little competition almost, you know, where we would set a theme, much like a set subject um, at Camera Club. You know, we'd come up with a theme and then we'd, um, usually what would happen is we'd have a guest on the, on the next episode and then that guest would then critique our efforts <laughs> on this particular, you know, yeah. photo. And so it's a, but it, it really became a thing um that almost like forced you to be creative it gave you something to do you know when um there wasn't really much else to do at that time yeah. you know? and, and, and yeah. thinking outside the box starts to become more important then when you don't have the world that you're i mean i you know yeah. travel photography is something i really enjoy doing and we've had a morocco trip a portugal trip uh, an Iceland trip all cancelled this year. We're, we've got another trip planned to do nature actually in Scotland in December in the snow, which is going to be chilly and interesting because that's when it's interesting and things look better than they usually do in the summer. Um, so, uh, yeah, but 
they've all been canned. So uh, we're hoping the Scotland one will come off and we, we can get some ptarmigans and, yeah. and uh, hares in the snow, all in their white plumage and uh, feathers, yeah. which uh, will be interesting. But hey, who knows? Yeah. There's this guy I met um, in the Canadian Rockies where uh, part of my family live. And uh, I met him at a, uh, at a farmer's market. So this was like in August. And he was selling prints um, of uh, local animals in the snow. You know, so it was like, you know, elks and uh, bears and, you know, all sorts, of, all sorts of crazy animals. But some of the shots were incredible. Like they were so close up and you could see every single hand, every snowflake and every hair. And, you know, there was one, uh, one particular image of a, of a grizzly bear, which I'd actually seen in my uncle's house. And so, and I saw this, uh, this print. And so I realized that was the guy who shot this, this image. So I went up to him and I had a chat with him and I said, like, you know, how do you, like, what kind of lens do you use for this? This is like a 600 or, you know? And he goes, no, it's an 80 mil. I'm just really close. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, what? And so, um, and so it turns out that uh, he spends all winter, uh, so fall and winter, which in that part of Canada is pretty much the same, and spring. Um, he spends all that time um, out in the in the in the mountains in the Rockies shooting, and then he spends the summer season selling the prints on farmers markets. And so every you know several times, this, yeah. there are lots of small communities and farmers markets and all of these. So every day he can kind of you know tingle off to an, to another one and then sell his prints there. It's a really really interesting thing. But um, the uh, the quality of those of those photographs was incredible. Totally insane, and the atmosphere from the snow. Yeah, you know, rather than it stood just in green as we expected yeah. to, and 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 like anything, any other subject you think of in in any kind of photography, different generally equals good. Yeah. Atmosphere equals good. You know, anything yeah. that just lifts it from what well, it's just a, a, a you know a portrait of a. Uh, whether it's a bear or whether it's a gorgeous lady or, yeah. or a guy with a beautiful beard, mm. you, you want to bring an extra element and snow is just but you know what, was, what was really interesting also, like, you know, talking, talking to him was um, that he obviously, because he's a local boy, you know, he knew, he knew the mountains really well. He knew the area really well. He knew uh, when to be where at what time, sure. you know, of the year and also what time of the day or night to get particular. And some of the shots were just incredible, you know, with, beautiful sun illuminating the, the the mountains in the back and did have like you know a, a bunch of like a moose or whatever uh, on a plane in front of it these images were just incredible but it's all really about you know having that local knowledge and and, uh, and knowing you know knowing your your subjects really really well I was in, this it was an amazing uh, experience and you know I, I kind of thought like I'm, I'm a little bit jealous this this sounds awesome like spending all winter like out in the out in the snow, yeah. and then nice then he stuff. said like, oh, sometimes he's out for like five days, you know, in like minus thirty, <laughs> minus twenty, no. minus thirty. You're like, well, okay, this doesn't no. sound that like great anymore. I'm no. not doing that. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. People are though, and that and you're right. Local knowledge is everything, and for those kind of things, um, when we go to Scotland, we've got a local guide because he knows where to go. Otherwise, mm -hmm. what do you do? Just wander around every mountain, hoping you're going to find a white thing in snow. That's kind of challenging, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've really got to know where you're going. Fantastic. Right. I think we're just at the pretty much episode number 28. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for having you on the show. It was an absolute education. Um, for those of you listening to the audio version um, of this podcast, be advised that if you wanted to see us in full Technicolor, if indeed our silky smooth voices aren't enough for you, then the video version of this podcast is available on YouTube. Likewise, if you are on YouTube and you want to listen to this in the car, um, go over to uh, Apple Podcast, Spotify, or Amazon where you can listen to the audio version of this. And remember, click subscribe, uh, leave us a comment. Um, if you're on Apple Podcast, by the way, you can scroll all the way down and uh, give us a little star rating and leave uh, leave a little comment. It would make all the difference. That is basically how we will be found in the eternal, infernal sea of podcasts out there. <laughs> it would be absolutely awesome. So, Martin, one more time, thank you very much for, uh, for coming on the show. Again, it was a thrill. And uh, we shall see you next week. That's what the music kicks in. Dance. <laughs> <laughs>